In this video, I want to provide a short description of the content which is covered in a book which I've written, which is called A Student's Guide to Bayesian Statistics. And the front cover is shown here on the left. And this book is now available to order. If you just look in the link below this video, you'll be able to see that. And I should say before I start to describe this book, the videos which accompany this book are going to be accessible on YouTube and they're freely available. So even if you don't buy the book, you can still learn a lot about the subject by looking at the videos. But I would say that if you want to learn about the subject in more detail, then buy the book and hopefully the video should complement it quite nicely. So you may be wondering, well, what's this book about? Hopefully it's fairly obvious from its name. It's about Bayesian statistics. And the idea for calling it a student's guide to Bayesian statistics is that it's really meant for students. It's meant for anyone from an undergraduate up to a graduate level. So in this book, I've tried to use as little mathematics as possible. And instead, what I try to do is I try to dwell on the intuition behind the mathematical results. And fortunately, Bayesian statistics is full of intuition. So hopefully this book provides an accessible way of learning about the subject for those people that might not be that conversant in mathematics. However, whilst I've kept the level of mathematics in this book at a relatively low level, hopefully the breadth of material which is covered within this book means that it will still be of practical use for researchers or graduate students. So the first chapter of the book is just meant to be a description as to how best to use the book. So it contains details of the content, how it's laid out, this chapter of the book also contains some paths through the book that I've suggested for people who have, say, a restricted amount of time, but still want to learn about various elements of Bayesian inference. I also recommend some additional material that is not contained within the book that you might want to look up if you want to learn more about Bayesian statistics. The idea with Bayesian statistics is that it all hinges around Bayes' formula. And Bayes' formula for inference contains firstly a term which is called the likelihood. We then combine that with a prior distribution. We divide that through by a term which is called, I call a denominator, it's got various other names. And that yields a probability distribution which we call a posterior probability distribution. Don't worry if you don't understand what each of these things is. I'm going to explain that obviously in the book. But that's the idea with Bayesian inference. It's all hinging around this formula. Frequentist inference, i.e. classical inference, uses instead just the likelihood element of that formula to do inference. So in chapter two, I'm going to compare and contrast the Bayesian and frequentist ways of doing inference. And so in this chapter, I'll discuss the Bayesian and frequentist ways of thinking about probability. Also, what do Bayesians and frequentists think about parameters? I'll also take a slight detour in this chapter to talk about the history of Bayesian inference. And we shall see that Bayesian inference is due to two people, one of whom Bayesian inference takes its name from, that's Thomas Bayes. And also importantly, although it's slightly forgotten, Bayesian inference also owes considerable amounts to Pierre-Simon Laplace. And I'll discuss this historical concept in this chapter as well. Although I've written down Bayes' rule here in terms of words, Really, the typical way in which it's stated is in terms of probability distributions. And so I've written down here the probabilistic way of writing down Bayes' rule. And the fact that Bayes' rule is written in terms of probability distributions means that we need to be able to understand these objects. And chapter three is about introducing the reader to the concept of probability. And I don't assume any previous knowledge of probability here, so we really start from the ground up. So we talk through what is the difference between discrete and continuous probability distributions. We talk about various concepts in probability. And then finally, towards the end of the chapter, we apply these concepts and use Bayes' rule to some interesting examples. So chapters two and three comprise the first part of the book. And this part of the book is really just concerned with setting the scene. Then in the next part of the book, what I do is I look at Bayes' rule in detail. So what I first of all start off by doing in chapter four is looking at likelihoods. So here I discuss how should we go about choosing a given likelihood distribution. I discuss why a likelihood is different to a probability distribution in Bayesian inference. And I also talk about 
the frequentist way of doing inference, which is the method of maximum likelihood. The next chapter in this part of the book is concerning the other element in the numerator of Bayes' rule, i.e. that of priors. And this is without doubt the most controversial element of Bayesian inference, but I hope in this chapter to convince you that most of this controversy is unwarranted. And in this chapter, I talk about why it actually makes sense to use priors in a majority of circumstances. I also talk about how we can construct those priors. I also talk about how changes to priors can affect the posterior distribution and hence affect our inferences. In the next chapter, chapter six, I look at the denominator term of Bayes' rule, which, as we shall see in chapter six, is actually part of the reason why doing exact Bayesian inference in practice is difficult. And that may seem counterintuitive, especially when we find out in the book that essentially the denominator is fixed given a choice of likelihood and prior. But the problem with the denominator is that in most practical circumstances, it's just too difficult to calculate. And this, together with some of the other difficulties of dealing with high dimensional probability distributions, mean that carrying out exact Bayesian inference in practice is difficult. In chapter seven, the last chapter in the second part of the book, we talk about the posterior distribution, and it really is the goal of Bayesian inference. So in this chapter, I talk about how changes to the prior and the likelihood can affect the posterior distribution. In this chapter of the book, I also discuss in detail the similarities and differences between frequentist and Bayesian summary measures of uncertainty. So that's comparing here confidence intervals with credible intervals. In the next part of the book, I start off by discussing the various distributions which are available for us to choose for likelihoods and priors. At least I found this a very difficult element of Bayesian inference when I first came to the subject. There seemed to be a huge choice of distributions that were available here, and I didn't know which one to choose. And so this chapter of the book aims to introduce each of these distributions, or each of the most common distributions which are used, and explain what they are, what they can be used for, with as little maths as possible. And so we start off with some simple distributions like the Bernoulli distribution, which I've shown here in the bottom left, and we move into more complex examples like the Dirichlet, which I've shown here in the middle at the top, and some more recently introduced distributions like the LKJ distribution. There are particular choices of the likelihood and prior distributions, which mean that we can actually exactly calculate the posterior. And those particular choices come under the heading of conjugate priors, which we discuss in chapter nine. And conjugate priors don't just mean that we can exactly calculate the posterior, they also mean that we actually don't need to do any calculation at all, because all we do is, if we've chosen a prior which is conjugate to a particular likelihood, then to calculate the posterior distribution, all we do is look up the result in a table. And I've shown you just a few of these results here. So this really is Bayesian inference made easy. In chapter 10, we take a bit of a step away from Bayes' rule for inference, and we instead look at how we can assess a given model's fit to the data, and how we can compare between different models. And so these two subjects come under two subheadings, one of them being posterior predictive checks, and the other one being various measures of predictive accuracy. And in this chapter, I'm gonna discuss both of these concepts in quite a lot of detail, because they're both invaluable tools in the Bayesian analysts toolkit. In chapter 11, I take a look again at the prior element of Bayes' rule and look at some of the attempts that have been made in the past to make Bayesian inference quote unquote objective. And whilst I argue in this chapter quite strongly that these attempts to make Bayesian inference objective are somewhat misguided, it still helps to know about these concepts so that if you encounter them in the literature, you know what's going on. In part four of the book, we take a step away from the mathematical niceties of conjugate analysis, and we talk about real life Bayesian inference using computational methods. So you might ask, well, why do we need to use computational methods in the first place? Well, it turns out that in the vast majority of circumstances, we cannot calculate the denominator term of Bayes' rule, and hence we cannot calculate the posterior distribution. And even if we could calculate the denominator term, it turns out we still have trouble because if we want to summarize the posterior distribution, we need to do calculations which are practically intractable. So unfortunately, in the vast majority of circumstances, we cannot do exact Bayesian inference. 
So what can we do? Well, it turns out that one way of understanding a probability distribution is by sampling from it. So perhaps the simplest example of understanding a distribution by sampling from it is throwing a die and looking at the distribution of the different values which you obtain on each of the die throws. And that's an example of what is known as independent sampling. So in chapter 12, I talk about sampling in general and I focus on the methods which are required to independently sample from a probability distribution. However, we shall see in the same chapter that unfortunately, whilst there are an array of methods which are available to do independent sampling, none of them are practically useful generally for Bayesian inference. And so we cannot use independent sampling to sample from the posterior. So what can we do? Well, it turns out we can do a thing which is called dependent sampling. And the most predominant method of doing dependent sampling is via Markov chain Monte Carlo. And we discuss Markov chain Monte Carlo in detail in chapter 12. And we also discuss the cost of doing dependent sampling versus independent sampling. Because independent sampling is the most efficient way of understanding about a distribution. And it turns out that dependent sampling, where the value that you sample next from your sampler depends on the current value, is less efficient. And so we discuss the concept of effective sample size in this chapter. In the following three chapters, I discuss the predominant methods for doing Markov chain Monte Carlo. And perhaps the simplest method of doing Markov chain Monte Carlo, a method of dependent sampling, is what is known as random walk metropolis. And that's what I discuss in chapter 13. In chapter 14, I discuss a more recently created method of doing MCMC, which is known as Gibbs sampling, which tends to be a slightly more efficient way of understanding the posterior distribution. In chapter 15, I discuss an even more recently created MCMC method, and an, in general, a much more efficient way of understanding a posterior distribution, which is known as Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. And the idea with Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is that you imagine a fictitious particle, here in the book I call it a sledge, moving around a space which is in some way related to the posterior space. And by using this physical analogy, that enables us to create a sampler which is that much more efficient in its ability to explore posterior space. So that's chapter 15. And importantly, this leads on to chapter 16, where I introduced the probabilistic programming language, which is known as STAN, which was created by Andrew Gelman and other colleagues at Columbia University. And STAN is a programming language that is well worth knowing because it makes our lives considerably easier in many circumstances. It allows us to do very, very efficient inference for hierarchical models, much more efficient than you would obtain typically using bugs or jags, which are two other programming languages. It's also, in my view, quite easy to learn. And importantly, it's very popular, which means that if you run into trouble, there are places to go to find out how to resolve the issue. Overall, STAN makes our life easier, and in this chapter of the book, I really introduce right from the ground up how to code a model in STAN and what the different code sections of a STAN program mean. And I've also compiled a kind of cheat sheet of all the common things that I want to do in STAN and are not necessarily trivial to find out yourself. So this chapter of the book also introduces all of these kind of tricks that I've learned throughout the years of using STAN. The last part of the book is to do with an extension to the kind of likelihood and prior framework, which comes under the heading of hierarchical models. So chapter 17 introduces what is meant by a hierarchical model and talks about why hierarchical models are so useful across a large variety of circumstances. In chapter 18, I talk about how to do linear regression, particularly in the hierarchical framework way of doing it. And in chapter 18, we examine a particular example, which is looking at developing a model to predict the GCSC scores of students in England. In the final chapter of the book, chapter 19, I discuss how to do generalized linear modeling. And I also talk about how to fit models which have discrete parameters in STAN. In terms of the generalized linear modeling, again, I'm doing so in light of the hierarchical framework, which we learned about in chapters 17 and 18. And the particular circumstance that we look at in chapter 19 actually concerns voting patterns of individuals in Europe. So in summary, this book hopefully provides a student-friendly way of learning about Bayesian statistics. 
The book doesn't have that much mathematics in it. I've tried to reduce the level of mathematics in the book to the absolute minimum, and I just focus on the intuition behind the results. Finally, if you're interested in buying this book, it's available for order on Amazon. You can buy it from the link below this video. But even if you don't buy the book, you can still learn a lot from just watching the videos that accompany the book. Indeed, I've tried to make the videos as self-contained as possible so that students that can't buy the book can still learn a lot about Bayesian inference.